My guest on today's podcast is Bonnie Morgan. She is a third generation performer. Her grandparents were Jewish acrobats in vaudeville. Her grandma Dottie opened for Frank Sinatra in 1942, and her father is acclaimed actor and stuntman Gary Morgan. As a child, she guest starred on such family favorite series as Blossom, The Nanny, and Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. She then discovered her superpower as a contortionist, continued her career as an action and creature actor. She worked for Steven Spielberg in Minority Report alongside Tom Cruise, Ron Howard as a Who in How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and marauded through the troll market for Guillermo de Toro in Hellboy 2, The Golden Army. In The Ring 2, she shocked horror fans with her terrifying and now infamous spider crawl performance as Samara, chasing Naomi Watts' character out of the well. Bonnie took over the iconic role of Samara in The Ring 3, where she returned with familiar videotape to strike terror once again. Ring 3, the latest in the $400 million horror franchise, was released by Paramount on April 1st, 2016. Most recently, she played Judy Punch on AMC's Happen Leonard and Colette in seasons two and three of a series of unfortunate events starring Neil Patrick Harris. For the small screen, she created the Crepuscula in Star Trek Discovery. She contorted for Patrick Stewart in his Star original series, Blunt Talk, and was broken and bent as the Terminator Rosie on Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Bonnie is also consistently in demand for commercials, becoming such famous characters as Flowbot, Flo's mini-me robot in the progressive insurance commercials, the Kia Sock Monkey, and the Comcast Robot. Some of her many live performances include opening for the legendary Paul McCartney in his Driving USA tour, as well as opening for the Mistress of Darkness, Elvira, in her Big Top show. Another feather in her cap is a Guinness World Record for her remarkable contortionist abilities. Bonnie is also a regular performer at the historic and uber-exclusive Bruegelage Theater in Hollywood, owned by the Magic Castle's Larson family. She is also an aerialist, sculptor, painter, swing dancer, high velocity spinner, can- canyoneer, rock climber, traveler of the globe, shenanigator, and an expert bird caller. Please welcome my special guest, Bonnie Morgan or Bindi Bonnie to the Live Like an Acrobat podcast. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for coming on to the podcast. I am just overjoyed and thrilled to have you on the show today. <laughs> Nay, thank you for having me. It is an utter delight to be here. Uh, wow, that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you've uh, you've had quite a career. You've uh, zhuzhed it up and down quite a bit, my friend. <laughs> it's living. <laughs> As she takes a puff of her fake cigarette. Uh, and <laughs> Very fancy that way. For those uh, listening in and not watching the uh, broadcast of this podcast, Bonnie is a redheaded uh, fabulousness of all things. <laughs> she is oh, very stripy. <laughs> very stripy. She is the, I think, the most expressive, one of the most expressive uh, performers and entertainers that I've ever met uh, in my entire career. And uh, it is a treat. So if you're listening on Spotify or on iTunes, uh, please come on over to YouTube so that you can see Bonnie live. <laughs> her mimics and her expressions. <laughs> Then everything that I just said in that bio uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm the most normal person you could want to meet. I, I don't know where she's getting any of this. <laughs> I'm making it all up. I mean, <laughs> it, it's it's true. I'm actually a CPA. No, none of that's true. That's wallflower. Else here. <laughs> wallflower. Wallflower. <laughs> Bonnie, I have to say, again, you every time I see you, you remind me of my mother, uh, because my mom and her entire family are all gingers, and they are all redheads. And uh, yeah, you are, we used to call her Pippi Longstocking when we were little. That was our favorite movie, and it was my favorite favorite reference for my mom. <laughs> I mean, and one of my personal heroes, truly. Really? And strangely enough, I grew up with a monkey and other crazy animals, and a completely crazy, permissive, acrobatic childhood. Like when we'd crawl on other people's furniture and they said, do you do that at home? It was like, um, yes, actually, yes, we do. Um, is that allowed here? <laughs> and the, the tea party in the tree, I used to read the books. I was like, why is this strange? That's what we do in my house. <laughs> so yeah, it took a really long time when people are like, what was it like to grow up the way you did? 
normal really is relative because it was completely normal to us until we go other places and ask, where's your goat? <laughs> I, they got a hamster was like, oh my gosh, where did you get that? We didn't have normal pets. I had a hedgehog. Of course you did. How many people can say that they grew up with a hedgehog? I mean, you are a legend. You are a legend. <laughs> I mean, like what they just, you know, riled up way to, 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 to come into. I mean, you were, you literally just grew up in and with a circus. It, to me, it was like, how many people can say that they had access to such a colorful, whimsical upbringing that just, I mean, you were kind of always on stage. <laughs> Outside of the circus train, not many. I mean, there's an old bumper sticker that Bob Yerke's Circus Circus used to have that said, I ran away from the circus to join a home. <laughs> and that's, that's how and where I grew up. All of my father's friends, like my uncles and aunts and godparents were all circus folk and stunt people. We'd go to Bob Yerke's backyard. He had a full flying rig. He had a cannon you could be shot out of, a Russian swing, which is like a platform on an A-frame that you launch one person off the end. And I think that was one of my first like injuries, but, uh, but almost much worse injury. I fell off the back of a Russian swing and got dragged under it and muscled myself back up. And wow. uh, I think it was Zepla Krastava, former Ringling Brothers, uh, she was top mounter. She used to say, I do triple somersault, four men high, no spot. <laughs> and I'm like sitting on this still swinging Russian swing. My knees are bleeding. I'm all ripped up and I'm trying to be, trying to be brave because you, know, you don't want to cry around the stunt people. You just don't want to cry. And Stella's like, you are so good. You did not let go. You're strong. If you let go, it hit you in the head. Maybe you'll lose teeth. <laughs> That would be worse. <laughs> so, and again, there were very real consequences and you didn't get hurt, but like, you know, ouch, get back up there. I don't want to get back, get, get back up there. Okay. Oh, you get back I up mean, there. You know, you've lived this life. Oh yeah. You get, you get right back up there. Doesn't matter. You know, you get and back you, up there crying. And you, you get pay back up for everything you learn. Oh yes. Oh In yeah. In one way or another, sometimes like, wow, I did it. That was easy. 11 <laughs> two times later, it's like, oh, there it is. <laughs> Fell down, didn't you? <laughs> doesn't hurt. No, no. I can do it again. <laughs> you just sniffle on through it. <laughs> I, I sniffled through a lot of things of like, I'm okay, I'm okay. You you have the tears streaming down and you make it through your blurry eyed and you can't see, but somehow you? you get back up, you flip again, <laughs> you can't see, but there's body, there's muscle memory. It helps you get back around. <laughs> you but this. not broken, shaken, no. but not stirred. <laughs> like I said, it's a living. <laughs> somebody's got to do it. I, I also say that too. If some, someone's got to do it. If, if not us, who? <laughs> and what's more, I mean, we are, we are all a specialized kind of people. And let's face it, we would not do well in a cubicle. No. Like that would go poorly. Yes. For podcasting, this is the closest to cubicle I have ever been in my entire life, entire career. I'm sure for you too, Bonnie, we're both well, just always looking around. My cubicle is a... <laughs> 15 by 19 by 13 cubicle. Oh, I just want I just want listeners to know. Again, the way that me and Bonnie have met is auditioning side by side on and off for years in the commercial uh, world in LA. And Bonnie brings in her, her little box that she wills it into her auditions. And everyone always looks over like it's a like box and it weighs 39 pounds. So... Bonnie's got the job. <laughs> Who's got the job? Bonnie booked this job. Who's got the commercial? It's what? Bonnie with her box <laughs> and her stripes. Because I don't know if people get the stripes. wrong idea about the box. It's actually a box. <laughs> but again, that's our cubicle. I spent most of my childhood seeing my father in tights. Like my father would put on clown makeup for auditions and people go, 
you know, they talk about their dad in a suit and tie and this and I'm like, again, normal is relative. My father put on tights and clown makeup and knew how to put on really good eyeliner, not guy liner. I'm talking like good professional circus makeup to go out. And it was very comfortable and very normal. We are a thematic people. We're a celebratory people. Every holiday, we're the ones that show up and they're like, oh, there's entertainment. Like, <laughs> oh no, I'm off the clock. This is just Thursday. <laughs> just another Monday. <laughs> like you do. <laughs> what a family, <laughs> what talent. I mean, your sister, I mean, you know, it, it's like you, you guys, you just, you, your, your, your reputation, your, your, your beautiful. I have to add my it fabulous sister, you. my sister, Molly Morgan yes. was the go-to goth girl, like pierced tattooed goth girl on all of these shows on Bones, on Dexter. And the fact is my sister is neither tattooed nor pierced nor gothic really <laughs> she's just a really good actress with black hair so again you <laughs> kind of get down these alleys and you get known for something mm -hmm. and moreover strangely in this industry often there's no getting out of it mm. you kind of have to stay in your lane because you know god forbid when you're on a circus job or a stunt job, or an acting job, you dare to say, oh, I'm, I know I'm playing this role, but I'm a capable stunt person. They're like, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're doing stunts and you're taking hits, they're like, can you say something? It's like, oh yeah, I'm a Shakespearean trained actor. It's like, of course you are. <laughs> Okay, just stay in your lane, <laughs> do your job, do it well, and look to the next one. I find it fascinating that you, with your bubbliness, your smiliness, the hor the amount of horror um, <laughs> that you- Oh, I'm very scary. You're so scary. And, you know, people that I've told about you over the years in passing in there, and I'm like, yes, I'm like, but she couldn't be more different. She couldn't be more different as a human being, as a person, than how you project yourself on camera. Because I'm like, again, this is, it's acting, right? Like, <laughs> that's what she does. But I do think it's fascinating that it's like everything to me that you are, are just not in that way. You're not scary. You're not- I'm very scary. Here, but you are very, very- very, very scary. I mean, the only way that I can watch things of that is because I know that it's you. And I'm like, okay, at least I know that it's Bonnie. I mean, this, you know, it's the ring. It's terrifying. You're terrifying. But I mean, I don't think that I, I wouldn't be able to watch it if it were not you, if I didn't know that it was you, because I the love way this work. you're just, I yeah, it's, it's, it's just, you know, when people see you, I'm like, the way you transform and your ability to transform is just exceptional. I mean, like the, what you've created, your niche is phenomenal. You know, um, like I, I was saying before we got on the podcast, I mean, there's so few of you. I mean, you're really, again, in your own lane, you know, it, it, <laughs> thank God. Thank God. <laughs> you know, when you can get in, I mean, like, you know, get in. I want to remind listeners, you know, for what you see out there now with things of what Bonnie can can do or even what we do like with circus, how it's become so familiar and so mainstream. Uh, Bonnie's like an original, like an originator. So, you know, like Bonnie is one of the people that, you know, was part of starting all of that movement. For me, you are. I, I, I really feel like you're a trailblazer in that respect. And then of course, like what, like, you know, how you've cemented yourself within the industry and doing so many different things and what you've how you've taken your talent around like there are you know we can you know count on the hands because like you said you don't just do stuns you don't just do acting you don't just do circus and contorting and you know I mean you do everything 
And, you know, I, I, <laughs> she is now mouthing and signing. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> She's signing. Thank you for those listening. And <laughs> my, my, my previous guest actually was a, was a CODA, a child of deaf parents oh, of wow. deaf adults. Yes. His name is Avi. He is Avi the amazing, and he is a photographer as well as a circus performer. And um, respect to Avi. we had yeah. a, phenomenal uh, conversation of his experience um, of deaf culture and, and respecting deaf culture within circus and in the performing arts worlds. And yeah, it was uh, it was an episode to, you know, to really shine a light on more accessibility. So thank you for signing, uh, Bonnie. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I mean, how is it felt? is he, truly. Yes, in all ways. And I mean, you know, you, communi- you communicate so poetically and so, uh, so confidently and so uniquely with your body in so many different ways. <laughs> and, I, I mean, I have a lot and I know it and it's, it's okay. Yes, <laughs> it's okay. I'm, I'm not for everyone and I've spent a lot of my life trying to tone it down. I actually on rings, uh, ring one and two were the Samara makeup and character was created by Rick Baker, who I worked with on, oh gosh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas and Men in Black 2. I've been a lot of creatures and aliens for him. The man is amazing. I mean, not just the work, he is the coolest guy. So his protege is a band named Aryan. Aryan has taken over, really, he was his protege and like he and Kazu, who won the, uh, has won many Oscars now for Darkest Hour and movies such as that. Aryan took on Rick's mantle in a lot of ways and took on Samara when it was time to do Rings, the third Ring movie. And I met him, you should know, Aryan is like six, seven, and Ichabod Crane and suspiciously handsome with great hair and (laughs) viciously talented. And I came into my first meeting very much like me. And it was uh, was Arian and Bart Mixon. Bart Mixon, I think he put on my very first prosthetic appliance when I started doing uh, creature work. Bart Mixon's amazing. He created the original It with uh with tim curry yeah no yeah. legendary people legendary you know, terrifying oh oh ethically so <laughs> first meeting him bart's there and i'm just talking about bart is being me and Ari is very quiet he's dutch oh. he's a very calm man hmm. so when it was time to begin shooting <laughs> he took me aside and he was like when we are working on your face, I need you to um, sit still. <laughs> sit still. Um, Me? Um, um, I know oh, you yeah. have a lot of energy and you're like vibrating, but um, <laughs> I need you to not, I said, be me. It's like, I, I did not say that. So after our first day of filming, which went wonderfully, I can absolutely, you know, sit for six hours while Mm. we do these, while he and his team do these incredible, incredible applications. I got a phone call that night from Ari and saying, thank you for for being so wonderful in the chair. I know it's very hard for you to um, sit still. And I was like, thank you. I'm sorry you felt that we had to have this conversation. So again, when you have a lot of energy, people aren't aware that you can get to work. Right. You can bring it down. Yeah. And people see, and I know you know this, Mm -hmm. what they perceive as circus folk, circus people. And they're like, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, the most well-adjusted, family, faithful community of people I know are circus people mm-hmm. and largely traveling circus people where the the children, the mom and the dad are on the train and they get out and the kids are wily and curious and capable and unpack and help. Strangely, 
the most normal, well-adjusted people you can meet aren't behind picket fences. <laughs> right. They're usually the ones that are very knowledgeable. <laughs> Things are not what they seem around here. Right. <laughs> They're the ones that are plotting and cause all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> and back to monstering yes <laughs> please continue there is nothing better for me being the scariest thing on set <laughs> i mean really now number one a lot of horror films even the biggest budget ones are are chaos it's just the crew is exhausted you're often working nights late bad hours and everyone is happy to see the monster. The monster <laughs> walks on set and was like, now I know we're making a horror movie. <laughs> so again, that's fun. Mm. And the work is difficult. I can't tell you how many times I've been crawling out of a bog after some beautiful screaming actress with a director yelling, run Ashley, get her body. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm stuck. Guys, I'm stuck. Get her out of the hole. Cut. Uh, uh, I have been buried alive more times than I'd like to admit. And oh dear. Weird situations that you get yourself into where literally you're in a hole, they hand you a rag a wet rag to put over your face and start filling in the hole. Mm -hmm. And you get up to about your chin, right about the bridle, when your panic voice starts setting in going, what are we doing? Oh my God. What are we doing? This is not okay. Oh my God. Again, you know this through what we do. You have to have the adult voice that goes, it's okay. <laughs> We're gonna be fine. Don't freak out. Especially when you hear from outside the <laughs> Let go of the rag and start start grinding your way out, like just clawing your way out of this. Like, <laughs> like you really look like you were. It's like acting. <laughs> All acting. All acting. <laughs> None of that was me. <laughs> And again, I get to mess with people on an offset <laughs> on a, on rings. We were filming in Georgia in Atlanta. Oh. And of course we're having some horrific electrical storm because one happens every third day and lightning struck one of our generators and the whole studio shook. And oh. of course our first AD is like, everyone holds still emergency generator should kick on don't move we're on a hot set so i start skittering around the set <laughs> i get up to our director naturally like, <laughs> bonnie get away from me i'm like Javi, what are you in? Like, i'm not telling you someone get her away from me where is she <laughs> and i'm just i was about two feet away from just skittering back and forth behind and lights going he's like don't do that I'm like <laughs> sorry all the hair in front it was more like <laughs> so shenanigans <laughs> well versed in shenanigans and if you could see the cup that bonnie is holding up to her mouth right now as she sips on something i don't know what but <laughs> coffee oh coffee so it's just coffee a lot of caffeine nothing but coffee nothing okay but I was going to, I was going to actually ask, I was like, do you do decaf like me? Because for someone else with a lot of, a lot of energy, even though I don't have as much energy as you, Bonnie, I don't think, I don't think I, I can't match that, but <laughs> I'm on my decaf. Just wind her up and watch her go. <laughs> caffeine is too much. It's like, it's like, okay. I'm already at a 10, you know, caffeine takes me to a, to a 20 or a, a soft 19. <laughs> if anyone doesn't know Shanae, she is. <laughs> So fabulously talented. She's actually in my phone as Shanae Fabulous Hand Balancer. <laughs> People will ask me, are you a hand balancer? And the answer is always, I'm not Shanae, but I'm capable. <laughs> I, I can do a hand-to-hand -hand depending on my base high hand-to-hand, -hand, but no, no. 
She's phenomenal. <laughs> You're like, phenomenal. Like mutual respect to this house. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bonnie. Bonnie is just the gift that keeps on giving audience. She is just always consistently beautiful and supportive. And she has always been that way. Like I said, we have our, our, our little times because sometimes we don't get to see each other for very long because we're going and trying to get the exact same job. And it's just the funnest thing of seeing each other for little increments at a time of like, <laughs> good luck. She always has something wonderful to say. And I will remind everyone, when you go into audition spaces, not everybody is always so open. Sometimes people are hyper-focused. They don't want to speak. Everyone's in their bubble, in their audition, bo- in their audition bubble. They're nervous. And they're intimidators. They're trying to be intimidating. But I love Bonnie because she's like me. I don't really think we can be intimidated. <laughs> well, we're no. just so happy. That's what I have, encouraging. it's very different from what you have. Yes, I've always I felt that. I will not be hired for what you do. Yeah, it's so and different. Like, you there's know, there's no reason, there's no call for that kind of behavior. I just don't I think it. so. I've never gotten that. And I love that you like mirror me in that way because you're just so beautifully. I don't even think it's confidence. It's like what you said. You just go in with what you know how to do and what you do is so brilliant. And it's so like all on your own. And I would love for you even more, Bonnie, to explain even more uh, for listeners out there that are unfamiliar with contorting and that style and, you know, just kind of how you bend and move and reflex and all of that cool stuff that you (laughs) how you get into the box um and then like your evolution of how you got there and like the discoveries that you made within that and you know and how you how you journeyed into that you know into that into your style I would say of bending and of moving goodness I'm I'm not even sure where to start I mean really (laughs) like you said third generation my grandparents were in a vaudeville Mm -hmm. So it was the family business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I imagine if the family had been dentists, I could be a hygienist right now. But (laughs) you've got such a mother taught my father. My father taught me at five months old, you stand the baby on your hand. Like you start balancing, you start playing with them, you get them, and some have an aptitude, and some just don't want to play. I wanted to play. (laughs) So my um I was a kid actor started out with all of that and my sister and I didn't always have the best relationship so after the accident nuclear (laughs) my sister used to try to pry me off of things and she literally like I bent but didn't break and then I'd start crawling around it was like Bonnie's being weird and my dad noticed that I was a dislocator and a front bender and he literally went I can make a buck with that. (laughs) So my strangeness, whatever it was, was highly encouraged. So I started out, you know, putting my legs behind my head, dislocating my shoulders. There's a, my uncle Roger was dating a woman named Marilyn Rising, who's also a contortionist who used to watch me. She'd go, come here, honey. Let me see if you can do this. And she'd like just kind of check. And it was, again, there was a, wonderful contortionist named April Tatro, who I would watch these people and they would give me pointers and train me. And all of a sudden I had a special skill to put on my, my kid actor resume. Mm. And it started there. And again, I was just a ham. I was an entertainer. I just like freaking people out. It was like my awesome party gag. <laughs> And it started to develop into an act. My father, when he was in vaudeville with my grandparents, said, always said, there's this thing called the doll act. There's this thing, the doll act, the doll act, where, and it was a a German act that they used to do. And it's the Germans, they would take the the doll out of his box, they would bend and break the doll, the doll would take the hat off at the end, and oh, look, it's a person. So... (laughs) Every time we went somewhere, my dad would be like, this would be perfect for the doll act. And my sister and I were like, yeah, yeah, dad, the doll act. <laughs> True story. So he comes home one day and he goes, we're booked. What do you mean you we're booked? He goes, <laughs> I booked the doll act. And we're like, dad, there is no doll act. 
goes, well, there's going to be one by Friday. <laughs> so welcome to the service. My, my sister made the costumes. My sister is a fabulous costume designer and scene mm-hmm. And listeners, we got out my dad's massage table and we worked up an act and that Friday. <laughs> we had a really cute doll act that we honed and perfected over years. And then I started getting asked, do you do a solo act? Mm. I was like, well, the first time I did a solo act, I traveled to, to Colorado for a corporate gig. I didn't have a box. I came out of a duffel bag (laughs) and just kind of figured it out on stage to a CD that they had. So again, it's so much trial by fire and trial and error that I was 12, mind you. So after a while, I got this zebra unitard and I put on this white makeup with zebra stripes so that you really couldn't tell how old I was. And I got booked at the world famous Viper Room. Like, oh my gosh. Wow. Circus at the Viper Room. Oh my so God. I get there, and they had this, this like, guy with a pony and an organ grinder monkey out front and they were doing this kind of psycho circus thing and I got to the back door you know knocked on the door they were like can I help you I had my dad with me he drove it's like I'm your contortionist like oh no um they said take a ride on the pony around the block We'll be right back. So I literally got on a pony and went for a ride around Sunset Boulevard around the bike room. By the time I got back again, knocked on the door and they went, okay, um, here's how it goes. They picked me up and carried me to a broom closet. They put (laughs) me down in the broom closet and said, don't come out and close the door. (laughs) They opened the door started playing my music. They picked me up and put me on stage. I did my act, got back in the box. They picked up the box and took the box back into said broom closet. Came out, waited. (laughs) They opened the door and handed me an envelope of cash. They said, you are wonderful. This never happened. (laughs) Don't come back till you're 21. How about those child labor laws, people? (laughs) She had a permit. She had a permit. She had a permit. (laughs) So for for those unfamiliar with the Viper Room, can you give a little bit of background of why the Viper Room is so incredibly legend for those that are unfamiliar? It is a Sunset Boulevard club, dark, fabulous. It is hosted just about every great musician. I don't have the list on hand, but you can imagine. Uh, It was originally opened with uh, Johnny Depp as a partner. I hate to besmirch the wonderful place, but it was the location of several celebrity deaths. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say who, because I think that uh, (sighs) if you look it up, you'll find out. But like, it was a place where fabulous people went to listen to awesome music and party hard. (laughs) <laughs> back in the day now it's of course uh, perfectly reputable and no nothing happens like that ever ever but tame the viper room was like home to johnny depp and all the phoenix kids and i think james inveld traveled through there and you know for those of you who are familiar with like rock and roll legends came through there <laughs> very grown up but no one could tell because I had zebra makeup on <laughs> oh no also for listeners Bonnie is very petite like me uh uh <laughs> incredibly petite. kid-sized very kid-sized I fit conveniently the overhead compartment <laughs> We get called upon a lot um, to help out with children's roles. Uh, I just want to say, because both of us are and have stayed incredibly, incredibly tiny. I stopped growing at around uh, 15. I think that's when I hit my mark. I did make it to uh, like to five feet, Um, but you know, we, (laughs) we, (laughs) Bonnie has not aged um, at all ever. 
and I assume will never. I think that she will be playing children. I uh, bathe in the blood of virgins. <laughs> They're hard to find. <laughs> We will both, God willing, be playing children until we can play them no longer. Um, <laughs> the journey yes. continues. I and how was that, Bonnie? Probably five foot. <laughs> and when I did, I never saw over it. I was also told I would not see five foot for long <laughs> because we start shrinking. So right. I am looking forward to my Lilliputian uh, size to continue to shrink. Well, well, I mean, again, more work. <laughs> the roles are overflowing and never ending because there's the versatility in that, which I'm very grateful for. I have never, ever, ever not wanted to be tiny and not wanted to be small. And, you know, I have to say fitting into those different categories of things. And I would love to hear uh, that the experience of what it is like working with the little ones, um, if you will, uh, Miss, bon Miss Bendy Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> um well I followed in my dad's footsteps I was totally the son my the joke was my <laughs> big sister was the crown princess and I was the clown princess <laughs> uh and I was an actor but I wanted to take my turn in the stunt department like my dad and I trained hard at mm. high falls and wire work and I hate to use the term acrobatics, but <laughs> knowing where you are in the air, having an awareness of yourself, falling safely, keeping others safe. Being, that's a huge part of what we do is safety in one another. If mm -hmm. one of your people is doing a big stunt, you check in, you show up, you hold a pad, you make sure that they're padded up okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we do. And again, being kid-sized, I kind of fell into the stunt department that way. I doubled three kids on Zoe 101. I was uh, Emma Roberts stunt double her entire round on Fat Unfabulous for Nickelodeon. I was like a staple over there for a while. Um, and again, you want to safety your actor and prepare them because sometimes they are capable of doing things or doing the intro or the exit to a stunt that they are not capable of performing. So again, you're, you're taking the hit for someone else and doing it fabulously, one hopes. Absolutely. And without it, more importantly, I spent a year living in Australia on Peter Pan with uh, Jeremy Sumter and Jason Isaacs and a very, very young George McKay in his first role as Curly. For the record, he was absolutely my favorite lost boy. <laughs> I wore a top hat for 11 years. And I mean, it was stapled to my head. And he used to steal my hat and I used to teach him to do Harpo Marx faces because he had this curly, curly blonde hair. So I have all these great pictures of the now illustrious George McKay doing Harpo shtick wearing my hat. But again, a lot of it is working it out for them and then teaching it to them, keeping them safe, making sure they don't hit each other with swords. I, I was on wires for 11 months, flying, fighting, falling. I did a, our uh, fight choreographer was a now famous Brad Allen. And he came up to me. He was the first non-Asian permanent member of the Jackie Chan stunt team. And he came up to me. He, and he goes, I've never seen anyone do a five rap. I want to see you do it. He's like, you're, you're kidding, right? He goes, no. I'm like, oh. So for those who don't know what that means, you wear a stunt vest harness. We call it a jerk vest because usually you're jerked out of a shot wearing it. Mm -hmm. So wear this vest. It's kind of like a corset with legs, if you will, and shoulder straps. They would put a line on my mid back and wrap it around my waist five times. You put tension on it, stand at the ready. And I had a 30 foot line that went to a cat track that was diverted to Annie Owen who would jump off a cat track 
onto a pad because we weren't even using a, a winch or any kind of an air, air assist. I was on a man-powered hand pull. And when he jumps, I unwind because someone was throwing Peter Pan and I was flying into the abyss and a net that was catching me. The net was only for show. I was hung, you know, 20 feet over water on the set that we were filming on at the Black Castle. So it was exciting work. It was fun. I mean, I spent a year in Neverland. It was wonderful, but it's hard, hard work and you do get hurt. I was in a, I was a stunt doubling for Wendy, Rachel Heard Wood, and fighting with the big, tall, giant pirate Bruce Spence from uh, the, he was the gyro captain in the Mad Max movies and the train conductor in the Matrix movies. Sword fighting with him and on take nine, he missed and laid me out. I mean, my head just exploded. Oh. And, uh, you know, he took me to the hospital, stitched me up as they called it in Australia. Take it at the cut and sew, man, you'll be fine. Like, okay. <laughs> cut and sew, man, put me back together. Like, I go, Bon, we're sending you to Brisbane to the plastic surgeon. I'm like, oh, good. Okay. Huh. So, Oh. The fabulous Dr. Lewandowski put me back together. You can't even see it. Got back to set. I was kind of, you know, waiting for him to give me my clothes so I could go home. And the assistant stunt coordinator came in. And he was like, how are you going? It's like, I feel like I got hit in the head. He goes, right, right. Um, how are you feeling? <laughs> and I said, are we going to make our day if I don't come back? And he said, no. How do you feel? I said, get me the wig. It took an hour to get the blood out of the wig. And I went back that day, having been through and finished the fight because that's what we do. Legend. That's a part of the work, folks. That's the things that people normally don't hear. You definitely get, don't get to see that. Uh, in oh no, day. and stunts is, stunts is a secret, mm -hmm. really. For mm -hmm. what we do, Stunts is one of the few categories that does not have an Oscar, mm. actually. And because I think we it were should. told that it's neither an art nor a science. Right. And really, see, not heard a lot of the time. We're only recently kind of, you know, coming out of the shadows, as it were. Right. And it's stunt coordinators like Conrad Palmisano, who was my coordinator on Peter Pan, who have really fought for our recognition in our industry. So that was my other day job. <laughs> so, I'm an actor with the craziest straight jobs you can find. <laughs> Well, I'm um, hoping and praying that your Oscar uh, comes eventually, because I do think that, I mean, you know, to be honest, your Oscar role would have been Samara. I mean, that to me <laughs> was Oscar worthy because I've, I'm salty about that. I am. That, I wouldn't go that far. I, mean, I do. People, we do have I our do. recognition, which is the Taurus Awards. You do. But, we um, do. We do. I mean. I'll say that lightly for myself. <laughs> it's not even a matter of the individual stunt person's recognition. It's as a department. Yes. Both. Really. Both. I, I'm not seeking the laurel for, for me, but really as our, our industry, our contribution to the film, it, I think it warrants some kind of recognition. Awesome. And does, does a little gold statue well? It would be nice. Well, I think <laughs> I think it's warranted. That's that's for, my piece for the department. On that, for you could do it for at least for the department, like what you're saying. At least I think I think it's crazy if, like you're saying, it's not on an individual level that it's not at least for the department because every other department is represented by Oscar, and I think stunts is like the last or the only one that's not right. I mean. Could be wrong. There's again, we slip, we kind of tend to slip through the cracks because we're a strange <laughs> combination of cast and crew. Yeah. And we're technically neither one. I people always ask me, what do you prefer to do, acting or stunts? And 
honestly, I, I love acting. I really do. I've trained and played and really love, I hate to say the craft, but <laughs> I love the work. however, I love the stunt department. I love the people, mm-hmm. the camaraderie. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, as an actor, you are treated like a child. I mean, really. We're little. If I'm caught climbing on something to get it down, it's like, <gasps> or if I say, can I get a step ladder? I need to adjust something. It's like, down the line, it's like, producer comes in, mommy, I, I understand you need something. Like, this, this is too far, guys. As a stunt person, you can literally say, I need two apple boxes, a Makita, a two by four, and that guy over there. Nobody asks questions. <laughs> it's just right there. So again, the assumption of capability and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> on a series of unfortunate events, they wanted a uh, made a tightrope walk, mm. which I do. Mm. And I even said, look, just to make it a little safer, give me a, either a line on top or a couple of handles on the beam just so that I can hold still for the close-ups. They were like, can can you do that? <laughs> Where's your stunt coordinator? Like, yeah. Bonnie, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm playing Colette. He went, oh, great. I don't have to double you. <laughs> so again, she can know, do it all people. They don't want you to get hurt because that costs money and time. Mm. So being capable is not always appreciated mm. because you hop up and do so. It's like, so, so it is what it is to that. <laughs> Again, you can do it all, Bonnie. You are just <laughs> magnificent in all ways. I am just so grateful to know you, to have worked alongside you. I will tell people we have worked with each other once in one commercial um, several oh, years ago. Oh it was just fabulous. We've at least had one opportunity. I hope that there is another opportunity within the next, I don't know how many years or decades, but I mean, you know, I, I hope it's not in too long before we get I'm that opportunity. I'm honored to share the stage with you always. <laughs> you are so, so, so fabulous. I wanted to ask if there's anything as we wind down the podcast that you wanted to leave the audiences with, with your full expression of your career, of how you see this environment. I mean, you've done so many things. And again, I want to remind listeners, you know, for a career like Bonnie's, it takes so much and she is so savvy. You don't get there by not doing the work, by not going, getting stitches and coming back into it and not just being able to, I think, just being a connoisseur of so many facets of this business, even though they're all interconnected, um, which I love for people on the podcast to hear and to see and imbibe. And it's especially those that are maybe familiar with the circus world, but don't do the commercial world and aren't interested or don't know enough about the stunt world and the dynamics of all of those things and how you can fuse all those things together and doing acting as well. So I just think that you are the most brilliant (laughs) expression of all of those worlds coming together. And then of course it takes the savviness of how to, you know, hold yourself on set and how to make those connections and how to speak and, you know, how to carry yourself. And you've definitely, I think. Getting the personalities. (laughs) It's tough. There are a lot of egos fighting. There's a lot of, there's so many things fighting you. I mean, you summed it up. Perfectly. I don't know what I could say to, to add to that, really. I mean, we could sit and talk for two hours. I didn't even talk about the sock monkey. <laughs> <laughs> the, sock monkey. Well, the sock monkey are getting Allen wrenched into a, a robot suit that you can't sit in once they, you know, literally bolt you into it. Um, and so much of what we do is being uncomfortable and accepting that. Yeah. And accepting how people treat you and not being able to fight back, even though you have an arsenal of verbal and you just have to be a grown up. And that's not something that we're always good at because our world is one of expression and play. And people put you in a box that you cannot get out of for the day 
or in their mind. And truly, faith, faith is faith, hope, and love are the indispensables. Having your own sense of self when someone has torn you to shreds, which you know they do and they have, when you're the best man for the job and someone's got a girlfriend and it has nothing to do with you and your disappointment is, is more than you can take, when you haven't slept for three days and you still have to come with goodwill and a smile, these are just part of what we do and what we love. But really, what's so important to remember is why we're doing this. For your art, your heart, your people. But really, I've had many times where I've been called home for a wedding or Thanksgiving and your schedule has literally made it so you have to fly that day. But when I get home, I remember this is why I'm working, is that I can have the freedom to be with these people, my family, and do what I want and live and laugh and love and have some fun in the meantime, sit around, have stories to tell, drink some coffee, and love your life and love what you do because it's not easy, but stick with it. If you follow your success, you'll eventually get your dream. And that's the hard part of sticking with it sometimes. Wow. Thank you so much, Bonnie. You are just incredible. You are so exquisite. That was amazing. That was so inspiring. <laughs> that was exactly what we all need to hear. Thank you so much. That was in service to the community. It was exquisite. You are incredible. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Bonnie, I have always, always loved you. I am honored to have you on the podcast. I adore you. I'm delighted to be here. Anytime you'll have me. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are just legendary. She is the original Bindi for those out there that have the handle, the original Bindi Bonnie in my mind. And I know in a lot of people's minds, so legendary. Thank you again, Bonnie. And I want to leave uh, the audience and all listeners with the Live Like an Acrobat podcast is also available on Circus Talk, the inclusive, independent, and international online network for the circus industry. Circus Talk's mission is to create a level playing field for this industry and democratize access to information. Until next time, everyone, please stay safe and stay healthy.